You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. All right, welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I'm going to be your spun out host, Abraham. And I'm going to be your dare statistic host, Shane. No, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have a little bit of an intro on this one. But before we start, let's introduce the fact that we are, in fact, a psychology podcast. We like to talk about things that we do and why we do them and why we shouldn't do them when they stop working. Yeah, I feel like this episode will be a fantastic lesson on checking your data and understanding your data and then also following that and making decisions based on data. And because this is so far seems to be an effective campaign, I'm also going to start by saying that if you want to see what we look like, if you want to see the backgrounds of our lives yes, as we record, you can join us on Patreon. You get to see a video of us recording this. We'll also send you our notes if you'd like to join at a tier that allows you to see the things that we have typed to prepare for this. Mm hmm. You will get early access to episodes if you join at pretty much any tier, starting at our second lowest tier. And if you just want us to shout out your name, you can join for just a dollar a month. And there's, there's various benefits beyond that. But, of course, if you can't or don't want to join us on Patreon and spend the money on it, you can always leave us a rating and a review. Even just the rating. Just click five stars or ten stars or whatever the maximum number of stars. Just go there. That also helps, too. That makes it look yeah. like we're really popular and that people really like us. So that, that can be a thing that you do. Yeah. And also, too, if you want to leave like a written review on anything, please do. We, we will see that. We will share it because it's always fun. Somebody commented on my Elmer Fudd laugh or somebody's Elmer Fudd laugh. We're not sure whose it was. So I mm. don't really quite understand. That just means I'm going to stop laughing on the show just in case. But yeah, please, please comment. Let us know because we do like to hear from y'all. Yes, absolutely. All right. Let's get to our topic today. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in and sitting through that. All right. Ready for my intro? I got this. Let's do it. I'm going to stretch. Get all prepared. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shane, according to the Centers for Disease Control, which is the United States premier sort of medical triage filter system. I Just guess you could say full on fact factory. Yeah, it's our it's our fact factory. Exactly <laughs> right. According to them, I'll abbreviate this the CDC for the remainder of this episode, Centers for Disease Control, CDC. About 66% of students, we're talking about students, not college students, but we're talking about high school and below. About 66% of students have consumed alcohol. 50% reported having used cannabis. Mm -hmm. 40% having tried cigarettes if not using them consistently, as one is wont to do. Mm -hmm. And about 20% reported using non-prescribed prescription medication, so the pill popping, using their parents' Xanax and whatnot, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And a 2019 survey found that youth from 12 years old to 20 years old consume 10% of the country's alcohol. Which, wow. Yeah, this is a staggering amount, given that in Nevada... Alcohol is sold 24-7. There are drive through liquor, liquor stores. We have Las Vegas. So uh -huh. alcohol is very easy to get for adults, which I guess could mean that it's easy to get for youth as well. But just saying that like our, our rate of consumption in Nevada is high among people who can legally purchase it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. A ten percent is a lot. Yes. Now, one source reported that drug abuse among youth increased over sixty percent from twenty sixteen to twenty twenty. I don't know if this has happened, but if there was something maybe noteworthy happening during that time, I don't know. Maybe a major event. Maybe some huge cultural paradigm shift. I don't know. Maybe just like general terribleness during that period of time. Yeah, I, don't know. I can't think of anything specific, but. Maybe something was going on. We weren't super tuned into. Yeah, the color orange keeps coming to mind. <laughs> like, I don't know why. A vague shape of Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The word yeah. fraud pops into my head. Yeah. For some reason, this time period reminds me of like a singular person with a lot of money who never takes the blame for anything they do. I don't know why I would do that, but for some reason, 2016 to 2020, we saw a big increase. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what relevant factors could possibly play a role in that, but there there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is all today, though, okay? Now, our story 
is going to start with the youth of the late 70s and 80s. We're going to focus on that crew and go into the 90s a little bit, but the story starts in the 1980s where crack cocaine was relatively cheap and easy to find. Now, at this point, the internet was still kind of a twinkle in the eye of would-be trolls and Al Gore, <laughs> and people are mostly using untraceable paper cash money, which, fun side note, there was a point where you could test just about any dollar bill and you would find cocaine on it or cocaine residue. Fun. <laughs> so yeah, the the people who you think of as the as the old folks today, they were the youths of the 70s and 80s and the victims of this horrible epidemic of crack cocaine. According to some sources, as many as 30% of Americans reported having tried cannabis, which coming out of the 1970s, what a surprise that is. Yeah. yeah. And the use of crack was estimated to have increased over 25% just from 1985 to 1987, just a sort of two to three year period, leading to a 400% increase in cocaine related hospital visits. Whew, and that doesn't even include heroin, yeah. which apparently was also very big during that time. Right. African-American and LBGT plus communities were particularly affected by this, as was Nancy Reagan, albeit in a different way. Nancy Reagan has some very specific thoughts on this. We'll talk about later. Yeah. So in 1986, the then President Ronald Reagan signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act as part of his War on Drugs initiative. And this sort of developed in correspondence with his wife, Nancy Reagan's just say no campaign that was oriented toward again sort of this uh, anti-drug approach now we want to reorient because this isn't about the devastating effects of their racist horribly racist policies and the ill-begotten war on minority communities specifically i mean the war on drugs uh yeah, that's what we actually meant um you know but today's discussion is about one particularly bright burning dumpster fire of a program that fit neatly into their agenda that is the drug abuse resistance education or dare program we all had the shirts we all had the shirts <laughs> and and the erasers or the pencils i mean which we should definitely talk pencils. about um, <laughs> so did you experience dare shane when you were in in school dare scared the hell out of me did it this is how dare affected me for most people we're going to talk about kind of like how dare just kind of introduced us to the world of drugs and what existed i learned that a particular member of my family was using drugs through the dare program and I remember standing in the parking lot of a Publix grocery store crying to my mother because I was so worried that this person that was in my family was going to go to jail forever because they were smoking pot. Like, that's how, like, as a as a naive and incredibly paranoid youth, it was the worst kind of pro. It had a totally different effect on me. I wasn't like, drugs sound cool. I was like, they all sound bad. And now everybody I know is going to jail. Oh, no. <laughs> It was really, really bad. So that that's how it affected me. The way you phrased it, I want to I want to check on something. You said using drugs through the Dare program. Did you find out through the Dare program they were using drugs, or they were actually getting drugs from Dare? <laughs> I found out what drugs were, and then figured out that the person was using oh, drugs. Gotcha. Okay. I was like, whoa, this is like a deep scandal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The information I got from the Dare program taught me that a family member of mine was using drugs, and immediately put me into a panic attack, thinking I was going to lose that person forever okay gotcha yeah i also got to contact got to i <laughs> i experienced the <laughs> program now interestingly it was targeted at different grade levels so i experienced it three times as i moved a lot when i was younger so from like fifth sixth and seventh grade i got a version of dare in all three years which meant that it actually skipped my younger siblings for most of those and then they got it later so next question, follow up for you. Did you ever end up using any kinds of drugs or alcohol? I did. I used alcohol as a teen and then I used drugs as an adult. Okay, great. So <laughs> yeah, same. And um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not to out ourselves too much, but you know, we found our way there essentially. Is yeah, yeah, what yeah. Happened. yeah. Now mine is legal. That's right. Yes. <laughs> They're all legal for us now. All above board, baby. That's right. <laughs> It was the one thing holding us back, you know? That's it. That's it. Except it kind of wasn't because we were teenagers <laughs> using drugs. We're and doing alcohol, it anyway, so. yeah. To be fair, I do have to say, I got into more trouble being a sober teen and being a straight edge kid than I ever did whenever I was drinking. So just as a, as a, as a quick PSA... If you are somebody that is out in the punk scene and hardcore scene and you meet straight edge kids, they're usually more problematic than the kids that are like smoking pot in the parking lot. I fully committed to not use drugs or alcohol by the time I turned 19. 
And mm-hmm. at that point, so I mean, it was it was all it had been illegal, of course, up to that point anyway. But at that point, and I just I committed to I was going to be that way. But I never wanted to call myself straight edge because of the kind of things that I saw from people who were doing the straight edge thing, mm-hmm. which we did talk about a little bit in our straight edge episode i think we did yeah what i like to call pumpkin straight edge this is yeah. the, the punk and straight edge episode. <laughs> yeah yeah or which i think ended up just being more about uh sort of alternative sort of lifestyles yeah in that way but the iconoclasts if you will yeah yeah so anyway because we were in elementary and middle school in the 80s and 90s like everyone else at that time and we're dating ourselves right now, but we uh-huh. were we were a part of this group. Everyone who is around the same age as us, you almost certainly remember the D.A.R.E. program coming to your school because it came to most of them, as we'll see. Yep. So founded in 1983 and started as a partnership between L.A. police departments and the L.A. public schools, it was a byproduct of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. And it was the tentacle of the war on drugs responsible for saving the children. Why won't you think of the children? <laughs> Why won't anybody think of the children? <laughs> so that's where it started. As you might imagine, uh, this drew bipartisan praise and it more or less spread like wildfire. And in California, that's really saying something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If politicians supported dare, then this was a specific sort of message and image that they were putting forth. They were pro cops. They were pro kids. They were anti drugs. This is a win win win. They look really good and they're supporting programs that parents like and all of that. And at one point, dare was in 75 percent of the nation's school districts. So that's why we say most schools. Yeah, that that is very widespread. You can hardly get anything that ubiquitous in the schools in the United States. You might be thinking, where did this funding come from? Because none of these programs are free. You've got to pay people to go out there. You've got to pay for all the the merch that they then give away, the t-shirts that say dare and the little stuffed lions and crap like that. Uh Most of this came from the government. This was tax funded. There was $200 million to an estimated $2 billion spent just in the year 2003. And even then, just before that, hundreds of millions spent every year. And we'll get to this in a moment, but there were the evidence was really not there suggesting that this was an effective program that they were running. Yeah, that's a lot of money to spend on something that doesn't work. Now, D.A.R.E. proved so successful, quote unquote, that it was implemented in thousands of schools throughout the United States and many other countries. So this went international, which I didn't know. That's pretty interesting that they they took it somewhere else. I wonder how well it translated in those other in those other spaces. Probably at least as well as it did in the United States. We'll about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things in case you've never experienced this and you don't know what we're talking about. This program was officer led. That meant that a uniformed police officer was coming into classrooms to teach children kindergarten through 12th grade, depending on where you were at, which is why as I was moving around, I had it at different grade levels as as I went further west, the grade level increased. And so I just kept getting it. (laughs) You got so much there. I got so much. And the only one of my of my siblings to uh, use use drugs at the level at which I did. So, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) there's that. Just as an anecdote, you know, for fun. (laughs) Anyway, the design was intended to teach these students how to resist peer pressure and to live drug-free and violence-free lives and to avoid gangs and that sort of thing. So that, that was sort of the angle and approach that it took. To familiarize yourself with the program, the mission was teaching students good decision making skills to help them lead safe and healthy lives. And the vision was a world in which students everywhere are empowered to respect others and choose to live lives free from violence, substance abuse, and other dangerous behaviors like watching Nancy Reagan. Yep, exactly. This was a very strange time in the in the world because we were having this dare program and we were also censoring music. So <laughs> it was so wholesome intended to be. It was back to the nuclear family is what we were is essentially what was getting at, which was horrific. Like just just such a waste. Let's make sure that we also paint a few more of the details about what this looked like. So these uniformed police officers come into classrooms. Now, also bearing in mind, they are 100 percent going to be English speaking. Most of them are going to be white, regardless of where they are. They're going to come in with a mascot who's dressed like a lion who is wearing a T-shirt that says dare in all as an acronym and all uppercase letters and then under white bold text underneath says to resist drug and drugs and violence they're going to then bring in a briefcase full of actual drugs in these fancy little glass containers as uh-huh. if they were like a diamond thief and they were going to do a 45 minute lecture to mostly fifth and sixth graders 
about this is sort of a scare them straight campaign. They're going to talk about why drugs are bad. They're going to talk about if you use drugs, you're going to go to jail. And this was a very much all or nothing campaign as well. There was if you use drugs, your life is over. Everyone you know's life is over. You will have ruined the planet, the solar system, the universe. You are solely responsible for every bad thing that has ever happened to uh-huh. anyone in the history of mankind. Yeah. If you even think about a joint, that was kind of their message. I don't know if this happened with you. I can't remember if it happened with me, but I've heard stories of like them passing around the drugs yep. to like to like be able to like because they were always in sealed containers and yes. stuff. But you could like pass it around and be like, "Hey, this is a crack rock," and you're like, <laughs> "Yep." Like what? Like and then a kindergartner is like, you know, raises his hand. What's a crack rock? You know, it's like and he's like this. Like it's a bizarre thing. Like when you think about it, it's like like there's there is this level of. <sighs> The, the best way to describe it is like it's like kind of the take on the Bible Belt's version of sex ed, which is just like abstinence training. Yeah. People don't have sex. Yeah. People don't have sex. You don't need to do this. People don't have drugs. You don't even know. Did you know what acid was? It sounds really cool, but don't do it. Yeah. That was in my experience. Passed it around. This left a very lasting impression on me, both because I was really surprised and also because I was like, well, I had no idea what these things looked like. That doesn't look so bad. Yeah. This is a little tiny green plant. Yeah, exactly. And, and then like later, it's like this heals so many things. <laughs> <laughs> so but like it was uh, it was an interesting thing because I, I don't remember. I can't remember if they passed it around in my class. I don't I don't remember that. But I do remember having the talks and I feel like there was always a dare police officer car planted out in front of my my school. Like there, I feel like I contacted it a lot. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, it was it was very hard to avoid. Mm-hmm. And I was in like rural Nevada. Like this was they made they made it a point to ensure it was out there, too. Now. When we talk about the success and failure of these programs, success and failure can mean different things because it's based on your criteria. So D.A.R.E. was very successful in one way, and that one way is that is parents and how they felt about it. So parents loved D.A.R.E., like loved it so much. Like it was like the coolest thing ever. It made sense as a parent. I would like I am all about educating my kids not to do something that's going to put their lives in danger. And especially if I'm going to be like, just like I don't let my kids trick or treat because there's razor blades and drugs in all of them. Right. Like that's the whole thing. <laughs> the Satanist. Just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. But, you know, they didn't have to talk to their kids about it. It had a cute mascot. It had everything that's like a parent's hallmark. Like they are like it, it makes it's like totally somebody else can do it. It's like sex ed, right? Somebody else can have the conversation about yeah. the birds and the bees because I don't want to have that conversation. It's the same exact thing. They don't have to deal with it. It has a cute mascot. It's parent friendly and it and it hits parent values. I don't want my kids to do drugs. Yeah. It, and, and also came with a dubious book we'll talk about in a moment that gave them some quote unquote resources. Uh huh. And they, these very out of touch people look at this and say, yes, that's definitely going to work for my kids. Now I don't have to do this. Totally. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to drink my fifth of whiskey and, and watch Jeff. <laughs> yes. All right. So research in the nineties to see how effective it was just highlighted how ineffective it actually was. Right. So the, many of the studies weren't even published because the justice department was so incensed by the, these unexpected findings that they didn't want to publish it. They, they had information saying this program absolutely, Absolutely, 100% does not work, and they were pissed about it, and they did not want to admit it to the world. So, Dare even took legal action to prevent the research from being published because you know they didn't want to damage the program itself, and they wanted to continue getting that those government bucks, them two billion bucks, right? Say, furthermore, like there is a lot of a lot of people who are lining their pockets from this program. They went all in on the Dare program, and this was a major source, if not their only source of income. So they're raking in the money and they are utterly unwilling to accept that this did not work because not only did that mean that they were wrong and this program was a failure, but that meant a cease and desist on paychecks to them. Yes, absolutely. So interestingly, the writers of the report that kind of said all this bent over backwards to apologize for D.A.R.E. and to discuss how successful it could be. But the data are what the data are. And it just said it didn't work. Yeah, I mean, they tried. But yeah, the D.A.R.E. program is like going to courts like they can't publish this this will hurt our program that sort of thing this is defamatory and the article was like we need more dare officers and we need more of this yeah and this isn't really working so maybe change your thing a little bit yeah i mean there were even some studies at this time that were indicating that dare increased the likelihood that kids went that that kids that who participated in the dare program it increased the likelihood that they would use drugs and consume alcohol at an early age yeah not that I am an exact, 
you know, representative of the fact that that is anecdotally true, but I am <laughs> an exact representative of the fact that that is anecdotally true. And that's yeah. what the studies were showing. Also, me too. And I want to be clear, like, this doesn't mean that, like, kids that were going to this program were becoming addicts and alcoholics, like, that were needing rehab or anything, but they were definitely testing and playing with playing in the waters. Like, they were, like, seeing what was going on and maybe used it casually or used something casually, but not, like, to the extent that it was, like, now I've got a whole classroom full of addicts. Like, that's not what's going on. Yeah. Now, a study led by no fewer than eight authors, so it's a, it's a, it's a full et al. type of article, yeah. conducted by the APA and published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, reported on 1,002 individuals who received DARE or a standard drug education curriculum. After 20 years, there was no difference in drug use, attitudes, or self-esteem across the two groups. So... What they actually found, too, was this idea of the possible the possibility of the boomerang effect, which was the exposure to drug information too early made kids more curious. Right. So instead of educating to prevent, they're educating to kind of prime somebody to go experiment more. Exactly right. Yeah. So the boomerang effect, again, meaning that they intended for it to go one way and it kind of went the opposite direction yeah. of what they were trying to do. Yep. There was a Washington Post article about how unsuccessful and potentially ridiculous the program is and for the one for the one thing i think generously it was absolutely ineffective all the studies have shown that it was ineffective several of them kind of even went the opposite direction dare was and is ineffective it does not work to prevent drug use the numbers demonstrating this started rolling in like they're they're obviously really th thrilled about the program so they wanted to show like look at how good of a job we're doing in decreasing the use of drugs so they're funding all this research research is starting to pour in in 1992 and the study at conducted at indiana university showed that graduates of the dare program subsequently had significantly higher rates of use of hallucinogenic drugs than those who did not go through the program. <laughs> Maybe they shouldn't have told all the fifth graders that there's like these cool hallucinogenic drugs out there that make you trip I, and see all kinds of crazy things. Now I want to, and, and this is something that's really important to recognize here is like, it, it, these are, uh, and we're going to get into why it failed, but I just want you to think about this in a second, like for a second, I want you to think about like, you've got a kid whose entire world consists of, let's say in 1992 watching Nickelodeon, yeah. And thinking about like, I don't know, like Dunkaroos or some kind of snack that they're going to come home to. Right. Like that's what they're and you're coming to school and going, hey, Bobby, did you ever wonder what it would like to see space from your bedroom? <laughs> and they're like, that sounds awesome. I want to be an astronaut. How do I do that? You do that through acid. You do that through weed. And it's like. Oh, where do I get this stuff? Yeah. Can I get it? Is it like it's it sounds like they like. They don't do a good job of like making it sound like the, they don't really talk about the dangers or get like a place where the, the kids can actually understand the dangers. So it sounds cool to a kid who wants to like fly. Like at the time, I'm like pretending to have like I have imaginary friends on the playground and shit like so, you know, it's it's a whole thing. I don't know. It's a weird it's a weird thing to think that you're going to tell five year olds not to do this. And then they, they're going to be like, I don't I, you're right. I shouldn't do this. Every subsequent study on the effectiveness of D.A.R.E including a major 10-year investigation of the American Psychological Association, APA, continued to find the same results. The program doesn't work. And in fact, in many cases, is counterproductive, leading to higher drug use among high school students than those who did not go through the same program. And because of that, DARE lost pretty much all of its funding when it got into the 1998-2000, is starting, starting to get into the 2000s. And they're looking at these things saying, like, we really can't justify spending money on this any longer because this is not only not working, but is making things worse. Yeah. So let's talk about why it failed, because the thing is, is, is we can talk about that it failed all day, but it's important to understand the mechanisms by which it failed and what parts were absolutely ineffective, which was essentially all of it. Right. But yeah. Let's go ahead and really get into absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, it was pretty much it was pretty much doomed from the start. Yeah. One is that it used, again, I mentioned this, but it used uniformed police officers where it should have instead been using experts in substance abuse and prevention and recovery and people who worked in a space where they dealt with substance abuse. Police officers are not trained to deal with people who are struggling with substance abuse. All they really do is arrest those people. And so they don't understand really the mechanisms of how they work. Maybe some of them do. There's obviously special divisions inside of police agencies. 
but they're not people whose their entire job is to like help people who are in these situations. And it would have been beneficial to use experts in drug abuse prevention and drug abuse recovery and substance use disorders, that sort of thing. And what this meant then, what this translated to is a lack of credentials for the officers. And not that like fifth and sixth graders are really questioning it that deeply, but they also like you certainly know how to talk about things in a more nuanced way if you're an expert in it. Right. And the other thing that happened is because they're police officers and their job is to do what police officers do, which will let you <laughs> fill in the blank there. <laughs> there was a heavy emphasis on punishment for drug use. It was a lot of don't do this or you're going to go to jail. Don't do this or bad things will happen to you and your family. It was really punitive in how it was describing it. No. It was really just this don't do it because bad things will happen to you sort of approach. Well, and arguably, too, by selecting police officers, most of the time police officers are arresting people who are breaking the law. So they are dealing with folks who are actively breaking the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll say like in, in an ideal setting. And so their experiences are probably with people who are in severe stages of addiction. Mm -hmm. So like you've got people who are biased against any sort of nuance with this anyway. It's like you're breaking the law, you're going anyway. Yeah, very good point. And that also leads to this zero tolerance style of policy that made it very adversarial, right? Like there was no nuance in it. And what ends up happening is it's basically the scare them straight type of approach. And this policy doesn't really work for anything because when you put somebody in a scared straight type of program, it's showing you, hey, this is what could happen if you continue to do these things. But then a lot of times... Like, for example, like when you see like these kids on scared straight programs, they'll go to the jail and it'll be all scary and people get yelled at, but they can't like nobody can do anything. You can't touch these kids. You can't do it. It's not like there's no for for every single punishing contingency they describe. They don't follow through on it. Nobody can follow through on right. it. Right. And so the so what ends up happening is, oh, you said this. Now you're setting false rules. Exactly. And that's so much of the problem with scared straight programs is they set false rules because I can continue to do this and, and until I get caught. I'm still engaging in the same behavior. It's actually not terribly different from how you might approach systematic desensitization to like a phobia is sort of like, well, a lot of people for what's going on with them is they have these rules for themselves about how terrifying or scary something is, right? You have a phobia of like heights. You're like, oh, if I go up high, I could fall and all of that. And all you do is you just put them in a situation where you see, oh, this isn't actually as dangerous as I was thinking that it was. And so they kind of do that unintentionally with this zero tolerance scare them straight policy is like, it's so terrible. It's so terrible. You'll go to jail. And then they, you know, they actually even put him in jail, as you said. And it's sort of like, yeah, this sucks, but this isn't that terrible. This like the language I had, the fear that I built up was way worse than what it's actually like. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, I gotcha. Like I, I can get through this. I know what that's like. And, you know, we actually talked about this with our disproportionality and school discipline and bullying episode of what actually happens in those systems is you unfairly target people who are usually in minority groups and that sort of thing, which is definitely what happened here. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So zero tolerance and scare them straight is, is just not an effective strategy. They try and do that now with like gun violence too in schools is the sort of scare them straight approach, which just kind of pisses kids off. And also, again, just doesn't work. So there's better ways to teach gun safety than running armed people into a school and firing guns for pretend to right. make kids feel like they're actually under attack. So, right. Yeah. All right. Another reason that this failed is that the this was there was just over the top pomp. I mean, this was like. This is decadent. I don't know if decadent is the right word, but it was like it was so gaudy and in your face sort of programming of like they would throw parades. They'd have these goofy cartoons. They had the silly mascot. Everything was so hyped up and big. And you you see right through that, like the 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 veil of illusion is so painfully obvious. It's embarrassing even to like fifth and sixth graders the attempt, the over the top excessiveness is like, Oh, come on. Like I can tell you're trying really hard, which makes yeah. it seem like you're hiding something. That's not that bad. Right? Exactly. The arrogance is something that really is. You're going to find the arrogance of this program is really going to lead into some of the other problems that we're going to talk about. Another one was that it was non-interactive. So the program consisted of cops conducting weekly 45 minute lectures 
while showing off confiscated drugs in a really cool briefcase and in fancy containers like diamond thieves, like Abraham said before. Like, so they show up with this like briefcase full of goodies and they go, this stuff is bad. And they leave with that. And all the kids go, where can I get some of that briefcase full of things? Yeah. But ultimately there was no question and answer. There's no like interactive. There's no training. There's no nuance to it. And it was very much so like you get told 45 minutes a week that you shouldn't do this stuff. Another reason this failed is that they refused to change or to use data. Now, It would have been totally reasonable for them to like think they had a good idea that ended up not really panning out for a few reasons they weren't considering and then be like, oh, we need to change tactics because you don't know what you don't know when you're trying to start a program like this. And so you use an iterative approach where you figure out this is a thing that did work. We'll keep that. This is a thing that didn't work. We won't. But no, this program was built on ideology, not evidence, not even really theory. And they, the people who were in charge of making decisions about how this, how this was conducted refused to make adjustments when the science specifically suggested and pointed out that it wasn't working. And that is a recipe for disaster. Things just don't roll out that way. Absolutely. And, and they went so much further than that, too. And they started targeting the wrong things. Not only were they not looking at data and evidence, but they were targeting the wrong things in this education program. And this is a huge one because this program focused on improving the image of the police to the youth. It tried to build self-esteem It targeted peer pressure as the primary driver of trying drugs. And it took an all or nothing approach by insinuating that at any amount of drugs you tried meant that you were doomed and the audience was probably too young for that message to land for many reasons. Either you were doomed or it scared you and you avoided it altogether, or it was just kind of so hokey and so campy that you just didn't believe anybody. And especially like, I grew up having a pretty decent relationship with the cops in my neighborhood. Like one of the cops taught me how to ride a bike. So I didn't have to have like a rapport building cop situation. Right. But I wasn't in a situation where a cop arrested one of my family members and sent them to prison. I wasn't in a situation where I was getting harassed by cops. So like, there's gotta be that, that nuance in that kind of, if the goal was to improve the relationship with cops, that should have been the program. Right. And that's not what this program was designed to do. Or like the idea, uh, the ideology of this program, it was designed to educate people on drugs and they took a, and like this kind of tangential approach to it. Yeah. It was just a total misunderstanding about the circumstances under which drug taking takes place. Like, Oh, you take drugs because you have low self-esteem. You take drugs because of peer pressure. You take drugs because you don't like cops. I'm like, no, the, not none of that is what's going on here. You really need to be targeted about what it is you're trying to change and what kind of behaviors you are trying to both reinforce as well as see a decrease. And they just weren't, they weren't targeting, as you said, like the, all of those things were not <laughs> like they, they could have targeted like anything and it'd been basically just as effective, which is not at all. Another component of this, this is kind of funny is a lot of times they included this parent education book. And and in learning about this in preparation for this episode, I really want to follow up with my mom and see if she has a copy of this somewhere <laughs> or if she ever got one. But it was so out of touch and hypothetical. It was basically useless. And that's actually putting it generously. So this book sported a 2000 plus word glossary of supposedly slang terms for drug and drug use. So the parents would be hip and know what how the kids are talking about it and be able to see the code of how they're talking about it. Obviously, those things are flexible, it's, they're regional, they change. It was a lot of nonsense in there. I hope that like it was full of things like the devil's lettuce and stuff like that. <laughs> My daughter found something that was like it was like like 10 cool ways to say no to drugs and it's very like it sounds like it would have been in there. Yeah. But it was like told like it's like back up lettuce head and you're like what lettuce head lettuce head yeah like for like people who smoke the devil's lettuce you know like silly things like that it's just like it this is not how normal people talk like this right. is not this is how adults think kids talk and it's not it's not at anywhere near accurate our memories are so short how we forget what it's like to be like talked down to as a child by an adult so yeah yeah it's ridiculous. all these adults are <laughs> Their brains are fried from all the drugs they did in the 70s. It's funny because I've heard adults that are like, you know, 20 or 30 years older than me that talk about missing quaaludes. And I'm like, (laughs) that is not a thing. Like quaaludes weren't around when we were kids. Nobody talked about quaaludes. Right. So that's an an interesting, like just that, just that fact, you know? So I don't know when I, when you read about like old, like punk bands and stuff, they talk about like getting quaaludes and like the names for it. You're like, oh, 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 that sounds horrible. That doesn't sound like it's fun at all. It sounds like very stressful. 
So yeah, if you don't want to do drugs, just read it. Just read "Please Kill Me," which is like a like a an oral history of punk rock. It will stop you from doing heroin and pills. <laughs> Phew, I was on the fence about that, so the, this book will be my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> So in addition to the slang terms and whatnot in the book, this book also included some fairly questionable sort of interview tactics and a, a sort of test for, for parents for telltale signs meant to determine if your child may or may not be using drugs. So for instance, they had this specifically in this book. If your child is reporting that something exciting happened... Or if they were trying hard to win a game that they were playing, those were apparently red flags that you should be concerned they might be using drugs. And I was like, children who are excited, who are competitive with games, I'm like, so human beings? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so that's you specifically. And, and definitely, yeah, definitely me specifically. I'm, I'm both of those things. And... I don't know. I just, it seems like what, what a ludicrous, who even thought that that was a good idea? Like you see a kid who's like a robot playing a game and you're like, Oh, whew, nothing to worry about. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, yeah. This person is a, is appropriately excited about monopoly. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> I would be so much more concerned if they're like, Hey, I won. That's exciting. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, they got into the Xanax. So I would have different concerns. If I was, if I had a kid that was like so excited about Monopoly, I'd be worried that they would turn into a real estate tycoon. <laughs> like I would be more worried about that, that they would be like, they're like pounding on the table going, give me all the land. I drink your milkshake. You know, I'm like, I don't want, oh, no, they're I don't want, I don't want a Daniel Day. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want a Daniel Day Lewis running around the house. Like, yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. Yeah, that's and you're like you're five years old. Why do you know that quote? Like that's it's horrifying. So that reminds me. There's a great uh, Saturday Night Live sketch with Adam Driver who plays like he he comes in for like career day and he is the um he's an oil baron and he's like yelling at his kid in the he's like you're an embarrassment. Like it's like it's so it's a really great great skit. <laughs> nice. All right. So later, Dare admitted to failure. Funding was rejected because of the failure. It adopted a new curriculum called Take Charge of Your Life. And the website boasted how great a program it was. Four years later, they were silent, right? There was there was nothing to say. There's evidence that surfaced that students uh, who took the course were more likely to use drugs than those who didn't. So double time failure. Yeah. Just uh, uh, tripping over your shoes again. Uh huh. That's it. These guys need Velcro. So. We're starting to get into sort of mid late 2000s and they get to turn around every now and then I get a little bit tired and I want to take a nap. <laughs> nice. <laughs> they've lost money. They've lost face. This program isn't very popular anymore. And they're sort of faced with a choice change or die. Uh huh. And obviously they opted for the former. The, the group decided to cautiously embrace some of the evidence-based research after decades of antagonism toward it. And the most significant change was the adoption of a new curriculum titled Keeping It Real. Real standing for mm. resist, explain, avoid, leave. So some steps involved in the sort of, again, say no sort of campaign there. And then the keeping does not have a G mm-hmm. because... You know, it's cool to spell things like that, I guess. Yeah. Interestingly, I also found if you look in the Urban Dictionary, keeping it real is used as like slang for living in the moment, living for instant gratification, which seems like the opposite. You'd be like, (laughs) you know, yeah, yeah. I'm just keeping it real. For sure. Gonna gonna sort some lines, gonna do a rail right now. Yeah, like several rails. That's right. (laughs) And you know what it is? It's that it's that meme. It's that meme of Steve Buscemi dressed as a teenager going, hello, fellow teenagers. <laughs> yes, just like that. That's what all these programs are. It's like they're so out of touch. Well, and I, and, and I want to be really clear about that. There's no way you could stay in touch because like teen fads move so quickly. Yeah. And they always come back at some point in time, but they move so quickly that like right now Among Us is not even a game that kids play anymore. They're like, it's so old. It's like it happened last year. Yeah. What do you mean? Like, just to kind of frame this, because I have a teenager. Here's what I've learned. Among Us is not cool anymore, but Jinkos are. Oh, my Lord. Okay. Jinkos are back. Wow. That was not something I ever expected to have happen. The thing is, is like these programs cannot be designed to be fads. They can't design to be like, like incorporate slang unless that slang is updated every day. Yeah. I mean... If anything, the name should be advice to the people who are delivering it is like, you're not going to keep up. Just be legit. Like, just say what you mean. Be honest. 
that you don't have to have a gimmick. You can have a message that lands that isn't like, I'm going to appeal to how cool you are by talking about yeah. Among Us. They're like, that's so yesterday. Yeah. You don't need a gimmick. You need authentic people that want to talk about this and help people. Yes, exactly. I'll come talk about drugs all day. Like, I, I, I'm all about it. Like, hey, don't do that. You know, but, I, but I'm like, I can, I can relate to the teens. That's right, because you're still cool. So, I, no cap. Right? I think that's what kids say. <laughs> so, cringeworthy title aside, some of the research on this program to date suggests that it actually works. And it was commended in the recent Surgeon General's report on drug addiction for demonstrating efficacy at preventing substance abuse. The secret is it's not an anti-drug problem. So a co-developer of this, the new curriculum told Scientific American in 2014 that it's about things like being honest and safe and responsible. So it sounds like maybe they're teaching replacement skills. It, or at least I'm more on that track. And just to be clear, you said it's not an anti-drug program not problem, but the program is not act necessarily anti-drug. Another reason that this one is supposed to work better is because it is more interactive. There are more opportunities to allow students to actually participate in activities. I believe there's some kind of role-playing stuff, some skits, some that sort of thing. But it actually has an opportunity for the students to participate with who, who the representatives are. Yeah. And speaking of who the representatives are. The people that are coming in to speak, the representatives that are a part of this program are actually representative of the children's community. Like it's not me showing up in a, in a community that does not look like me going like, Hey kids, you want to learn about drugs? Like it's not, that's not what's happening. Right. So like the people are members of the community, they're representative of the community. They're a part of the community. They have a vested interest in protecting and supporting and educating the community. And that makes a huge difference. Yeah. And it also means that the program is more adaptive to the culture and ethnicity of the students in the program. It also means that they should be more targeted toward the kind of drugs, the kinds of drugs that are more likely to appear in those communities. So it's not like you go into a community where they've never heard of heroin and you're like, and they have a problem with crack and you're like, here's heroin. It's a really bad drug. You shouldn't take it. And they're like, heroin, you say. <laughs> yeah. A new thing. Novelty. Exactly. You want to focus more on what's actually relevant to the kind of experience they're going to have. Further, this program is designed to target higher grade levels. That makes more sense because you have a group of people who are more likely to be able to understand nuance and decision making and and may are, are more likely to experience this. If you go into a kindergarten and the kids dealing heroin in the kindergarten class, there's a, there's a whole different problem there. <laughs> but like for adults or like high school students or like late middle school students, I would say eighth to like 12th grade, you're more likely to have these conversations that are more nuanced and, and the group is going to be more receptive. Right. So there's really no doubt that D.A.R.E. is currently making an effort. Effort at least to adopt a more evidence-based approach than in prior years when the program's practices were largely driven by the belief that they were pure as the driven snow. <laughs> but this brings us back to the central irony of Jeff Sessions' remarks when he uh, yearned for the return of the dare of the 1980s and 1990s <sighs> because... You know, you know what you didn't think we we're going to get through this episode without talking about Jeff Sessions, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it of had course, to come up. Of course it was going to come around. Yeah. He was a big believer and he's like, you know, dare, we need to bring it back. We need to get it back in schools. Dare really works. Despite the fact the evidence shows that it doesn't, despite the fact that there are over 60 evidence based programs that, that do. And also despite the fact that he is almost certainly on several illicit drugs all the time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So let's step away from Jeff Sessions for a moment. How about forever? Forever. I mean, I'm fine <laughs> with that forever. Yes. But let's talk about the research to su actually support these types of programs and not just keeping it real, but just in general. Right. So first, we have to recognize that it is being taught much differently than it was when we were kids. We mentioned the interactive and the group work part of it. And this is very much so do this, not tell me this. Right. Like like. When you engage in active learning and you are engaged with the material and you are interactive, these new strategies tend to be more effective. Like you tend to learn more. And we're not saying that hands on is the only approach. It's a combination of lecture and visuals and audio and actual like engagement with those activities. Yeah. So talking about keep it real, there's an article and, and in part of the abstract, it said, quote, the results revealed that the intervention produced significant effects on preventative factors such as the likelihood of resisting peer pressure, increased responsible decision-making, knowledge and decision-making skills, and confidence in being able to explain why they would refuse offers of cigarettes. So apparently specifically. And the results of this study suggest that Dara's elementary keeping it real program has promised in a social and emotional learning-based intervention program as well, end quote. With that, 
There was also a meta-analysis to review the effectiveness of the D.A.R.E. program, and the article shows that changes in the program were needed to make it effective. And that's why we have Keeping It Real, and that's why we have the interactive piece now, and the more representative people in the communities. Now, I did find an article that was published in 2015 in what appeared to be a reputable journal suggesting that the Keeping It Real program is really much less effective than they're boasting that it is. Mm -hmm. Mostly what they were saying is that the research that has been done so far has been tested on a relatively narrow audience. It has not actually been shown to be effective with younger elementary school students. And it hasn't really been the different versions that exist. Only like a very small sliver. It has actually been tested for efficacy where it does seem to be effective. So there are just a few caveats here where it seems like, and I was unable to find anything that was more up to date, suggesting otherwise, fortunately on that website uh, where the article was, they even have a little button you can click that says check for more up to date information. And it says, this is up to date. Oh, nice. So if I can trust that button at all, then I'm believing that nothing, none of this has been definitively refuted at least in terms of the keeping it real program yeah but those are some things to consider is that this may not necessarily be as effective as they're boasting but it might be okay and then also i went ahead and linked a website in i'm not going to go through all of them but i found a website that listed a bunch of evidence-based programs and who sort of credentialed them as being evidence-based. There were about 66 of them if i remember correctly not going to read through those programs but the list will be in the show notes, not the list itself, but the link to the website where you can find the list will be in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been talking a lot about evidence base, and I think it's really important to understand the effective teaching methods that you can find used in a variety of settings that's generalized in a variety of places that can be used with a lot of flexibility that may make a program like this more effective. Yes. So The first thing is, is that whenever you are using language to try to instruct somebody what to do versus not to do, do language is so much better than don't language. If I say, don't throw this on the floor versus please throw this in the trash, I'm more likely to see somebody take that, whatever that item is and throw it in the trash than than they would throw it on the floor. Like, but don't language will tell me, like, it tells me what not to do. It tells me what to avoid, but it doesn't tell me what to do instead. And it also gives me the idea of n- of doing that thing that you told me not to do because people don't like being told what to do sometimes. Yeah, and and what not to do. And what not to do. So using do language has been found to be more effective in a lot of different scenarios. And another one is just, as we mentioned, the original approach to this was largely punitive. And we did an episode on punishment as well. Uh, so you can see that for more more thorough discussion of that. But there is the general approach of using a more reinforcement based versus a more punitive based approach. Now, when you use punitive measures, those can be effective for stopping very specific circum- behaviors under very specific circumstances. But what you also tend to get is a lot of lying and sneaking around because when you use punishment you haven't actually addressed at all the reason that that was occurring in the first place all you've tried to do is superimpose a new outcome and make it you know more powerful than the original outcome which was something good which is why they were doing it in the first place right so instead if you can create an incentive to do something else then people will voluntarily move their they'll allocate their attention toward the thing that you are, that it has a better incentive. And that's why we tend to go for reinforcement based strategies because it is non coercive. It tends to result in a voluntary allocation of one's attention and resources and time and whatnot toward the thing that you actually want to see. And that, that also would be a key step in any program that's going to try and have students or, you know, anybody choosing something other than drugs. Yeah, absolutely. That leads into the next point too, which is that we have to understand where reinforcement is coming from. Yeah. When we understand where reinforcement is coming from, where those rewards are coming from, most of the time kids are finding rewards with their friends and those, those social relationships. Now there are other factors to include here, right? I mean, there are plenty of studies that demonstrate that using drugs is a coping mechanism for some significantly trauma, traumatic events. Maybe it is uh, some type of escape from some kind of aversive situation at home. There are a lot of factors that we have to include here and talk about that again at the end of the day we have to understand what the function of that is what's what's the reason why somebody would do that to begin with and simply put a lot of times people start using drugs because it feels good and then it leads into some other things once once you get into addiction but we have to start by understanding where that reward comes from to begin with absolutely yeah and because if you try and and design a system that targets 
some hypothetical source of reinforcement where that's not where it's actually coming from, then it's just going to fail because it doesn't actually address the nature of the issue. Absolutely. Another one that I think is relevant, worth considering and understanding from how we know behavior sort of works is setting clear expectations is another one of, you know, the reason that we want to make these choices, that we want kids to make these choices is because we want them to be safe. We want them to be successful. And so setting clear expectations around what you want them to, what you want to see and what you what you want for them and enrolling them in that, you know, what do they want for themselves? And then once you have clear guidelines on what, what appropriate and recommended things to do would include, that is a nice sort of prevention that you can do before you are dealing with the reactive part of people making that choice. Yeah, absolutely. I think you nailed it. Thanks. We have some other fun, interesting tidbits on here. Yeah. So the first thing is that Dare made a board game. And you can purchase it on Amazon if you want to. They partner with Parker Brothers. And the thing is, is that I want this game to... I don't know what this game is going to entail. Like, I didn't really look at the details. But what I want it to be is I want it to be like kind of like how a Monopoly, there's a banker. But I want somebody to be the dare cop that shows up with the briefcase. And it's like, no, you made the wrong choice. Go to Joe to jail. And everybody does something like that. Or um, that there is like a, a set of drugs that you hand around and pass around and see what kind of choices people make when they're handed the drugs. Yeah, I thought, I thought maybe you're going to suggest someone be the drug dealer. in that. Yeah, I'll be fine with that, too. Like almost a like clue. Like who's the drug dealer? Like, or I, I'm fine with any of those variations of this. Man, look into this picture. This is as 80s of a board game as I have ever seen. Uh huh. Maybe even like late 70s. Like, this is, it, it, it is in a condition, let's just say. Yes. 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 I also, I've never, I never heard of it before we prepared for this. So it, it is uh, a interesting thing to behold. I think as a sort of freak show novelty, it, it would be fun to, see but i would not want to spend any amount of money on actually owning it yeah exactly exactly i want to go to the dare museum as we mentioned nancy reagan is specifically credited with the just say no slogan that is associated with the war on drugs and dare so nancy rogan uh, nancy not nancy rogan nancy reagan <laughs> the full-on enemy of nike <laughs> yeah indeed and then jeff sessions attorney general slash old white guy still <laughs> believes that dare was an instrumental success in educating children on the dangers of drug use despite the decades of evidence against it which just goes to this to show that like old white guys shouldn't be making decisions. You know, honestly, that's so on brand for him, though, that I would have been legitimately concerned if he was like behind something that was evidence based. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would have been like, wait, Jeff Sessions supports something other than the D.A.R.E. program. Now I'm questioning that thing that he supports. Yeah. But the fact that he's going to, you know, put all of his money down on something that has proven ineffective is 100 percent where i expect him to be so i think that that is right on the money oh totally like it is it is very much so on brand for him like you said sweet any other anything else before we get to take home points i think the only thing i would say another interesting tidbit was i think the shirt was designed well like i would wear that shirt now it's fair that's fair yeah all right well let's go ahead and and put a bow on this pack it into a fancy briefcase and and say like what what are we taking away from this episode i'll let you go first yeah so D-A-R-E, D.A.R.E., the original purpose and implementation was not effective. Many studies prove it, and they have proved it time and time again that talking at someone is not teaching. And as a matter of fact, exposing students and exposing kids who have never been exposed to certain types of drugs have now made them curious and have likely led to them at least experimenting. Not addictions, but at least experimenting some way. So drugs was the 80s sort of uh, 9-11 I mean, this was what society needed to have an enemy or something to be scared of. Uh, you know, I think a common piece of political rhetoric for motivating your base is use of fear. I definitely see that that has been frequently employed in, in very recent memory. Uh -huh. And this was really spurred on by Nancy Reagan and the, and the no drug or war on drugs movement. Scare tactics were rampant and leading to this useless dumpster fire of a program. So I think that's one thing that we contribute to is the having some kind of righteous cause is par for the course. Yeah. Particularly for people. I think that for Nancy Reagan and, and people of that persuasion, this was very much par for the course for those, the people of that type 
who that's what they needed in life. And to provide more context, I mean, during the 80s, like the late 70s and early 80s, you had the satanic panic. Yeah, exactly. And now you put like, okay, so there's a satanic panic and there's drugs and we need a pure nation. We need this. And that's and that's where all this abstinence training and stuff comes from is, is that there is this, this the, the devil is taking care of or taking over. <laughs> Indeed. Which is like just so, it's just so silly. And we should probably do an episode on the satanic panic at some point in time because it was about so that. harmful. Yeah. It was so incredibly harmful. And and we could totally talk about the West Memphis Three within that too. Yeah, absolutely. So the new D.A.R.E. mission and vision seems to be pointed in the direction of being more evidence-based. However, more research is still needed to be completed to be able to show whether or not the Keeping It Real program is effective for children, whether it works, whether it has some kind of long-term beneficial outcomes. We don't really know yet. It's a step in the right direction, I would say, in terms of like they've made revisions. They realize that there didn't work. So I just think that there just needs some more evidence to see if it is something that will actually work and worth spending spending time and money on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, big take home point. Dare to resist failed drug prevention intervention programs. It was a big sloppy mess. It had poor outcomes and didn't work and good riddance. Now, yep. I think the fact that they're trying to go the right direction is a positive thing. I definitely think if anybody out there who is in charge of this is listening to me, and I know that you're not, but you know, were you <laughs> were I to be giving out advice that someone might adhere with respect to this, it is yeah, just use science, man. Like that has always been our solution to everything. Yeah. Use science, things get better. You don't use science, things get worse. That's true. Every place we look at, and I mean, right today, you could go somewhere and find some place where that is true, where someone is not using science and things are going poorly and somewhere it is someone is using science and things are going well. It is just rampant because it is the best method we have for being effective humans. Yep, absolutely. 100%. I couldn't I couldn't have come up with a better take home point myself. Lovely. Well, in that case, I think we're ready for some recommendations. Let's do it. Okay, I stumbled across this the other day in a Whole Foods. If you happen to be near a Whole Foods, that giant chain that charges way too much for things and is now owned by Amazon, Mm -hmm. they have these chocolate truffles. And these chocolate truffles cater to a wide variety of diets. That's nice. Yes. They also have cappuccino truffles, which I did not get to try. And they had like four different types. These are not the mushrooms truffles. These are the very, very rich chocolatey treat truffles, and they are absolutely delicious. You can't eat more than like three at a time before you need to take a break. Even one at a time is they're just that incredibly rich. But if you are into chocolate, if you are into very rich, silky, delicious chocolates, things then i would highly recommend the the whole foods chocolate truffles and maybe try some of the other truffles maybe they're good too yeah i like that i like that chocolate rules so nice. i think that's wonderful my recommendation is a movie i was able to go see eternals Ooh. the new marvel cinematic universe number 26 i believe it is in the in the movie numbers <sighs> oh my goodness which is wild but what's great about it is you don't have to watch any of the other marvel movies to watch it Okay. It makes literally one reference, two references. It makes references to the Avengers. It makes references to the snap. But what's really great about it is that it is just shot beautifully. It looks just incredible. It spans a long period of time and it introduces 10 brand new characters that have really interesting and unique dynamics and unique powers and, and really, I think makes you start caring about them pretty quickly. Some really key points that I want to make is that right now, if you go and you look at the critics reviews, it shows that it's certified rotten and that's just dumb (laughs) because it's not the audience really enjoys it. It scored like a 90% or so 86% is the last what I saw on, um, on rotten tomatoes. Um, if you go by any of that and trust any of that, what I say is go in with no expectations and enjoy it. It's representative. There's the, the group of people are representative, which is really cool. Angelina Jolie is actually really fantastic in it. You know, like I was like really impressed with her work in it. And probably my most impre- my most impressed moment was that they use actual American Sign Language. Oh, cool! With because uh, one of the one of the actresses is deaf, 
And so she uses sign language and they communicate with her throughout it using real sign language, which is really, really impressive. That's neat. I bet the fact that it was diverse is part of the reason it received poor reviews because the trolls came out in full force like they did for Captain Marvel. Of course. Honestly, the other thing, too, is I think, you know, they judge Marvel movies by other Marvel movies. And while I think that's a reasonable thing to do, you also got to consider the context. I mean, you've got movies that come out like some of the Hellraiser sequels that have come out and they're just so bad. They're so bad. They're like embarrassing and they make you blush. And then you stack that next to something like this and you're sort of like, oh, yeah, that movie is like 100 percent A. Yeah. And maybe it's not 100 percent A. Like, there's also some really wonderful movies out there. But just saying, like, you know, have a little perspective. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think I think one thing that everybody misses about Marvel is that, like, they're not all superhero movies. Like, they are genre movies with superheroes in them. Like, Mm -hmm. if you watch Winter Soldier, Winter Soldier is absolutely an action spy movie. Yeah. Right. If you watch Thor, it's a it's a it's a buddy cop movie yeah like in space right like thor ragnarok specifically right? right 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 and this one is a really great like historical mythology type of story like and so it's gonna be a little bit more serious and it's gonna have it's not gonna have as many quips and stuff but it, it's still done really really well so i enjoyed it please go watch it let me know what you think awesome all right as we are wrapping this up part of the reason this podcast exists is because i have a really awesome team of people and that team includes shane who's helping me today hey y'all it also includes justin amber Britt, selena kyle and alan Britt, for uh, we should thank specifically because she helped us prepare the notes for this episode yep so welcome back to the team in addition to that we have some financial support from some amazing people who get all those benefits i listed at the top of the episode that includes a shout out to amanda kathleen justin justine kim costia layla megan mike m mike t and shauna thank you all so much you are wonderful and I appreciate you all. If you would like to tell us about your experiences with Dare or programs that you wish had taken Dare's place or your own little homebrewed Dare type drug prevention <laughs> program, or if you want to yeah. share super fun drug fueled stories with us, we're happy to hear those things. Yeah. You can reach us at our email address, info at www.dwwdpodcast.com. We also respond to social media things at www.dwwdpodcast, and we are happy happy to hear from you i think that is all i have you have anything shane i don't have anything else all right this is abraham this is shane we're out see ya you've been listening to why we do what we do why we do what we do is supported in part by our amazing patrons thank you if you like what you heard consider becoming a patron by heading to patreon.com slash wwd wwd podcast you can also rate and review us wherever you get your podcast or share this episode with your friends. If you have any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Find us at WWD Podcast on your favorite social media platforms. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.dwwdpodcast.com. There you'll find links as well as detailed and shareable show notes. Why We Do What We Do is researched and produced by Abraham, Ryan O, Shane, and Miranda. Artwork and logo design by Andrew Pollock at nogdesigns.com. Video and production assistance from Tyler Brassier with music courtesy of Justin Greenhouse. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. To familiarize yourself with the program, the mission of this was to quote, uh, was quote, cheating, <laughs> cheating, <laughs> cheating students, <laughs> teaching students, <laughs> good decision making. Freudian slip. Sorry. <laughs> it was cheating and lying students. It was, it was wild.